So we'll start off now with our presentations. The first one is by Professor Andrew Allen. Professor Allen holds dual roles as Professor of Plant Science at the Faculty of Science and as the lead researcher at the Crown Research Institute Plant and Food Research. He and his then doctoral candidate, Richard Espley, conclusively mapped the gene that decides the red color in apples. He's working on a five-year endeavor-funded project, The Flowering Crisis, confronting a changing climate threat to New Zealand's tree crops. Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, learned colleagues, uh, it, I have a huge challenge kicking this off today. Um, and maybe the biggest challenge is to conv convince you that plants are a third of the solution to the climate crisis. You, know, you all think, oh, he's a plant biologist, he would say that. But by the end of this talk, some of you will be with me um, on this crusade. The key thing, the, the, not the challenge of my talk, the real, the real challenge is in the next 20 years, we've got another billion people to feed, and we've got to feed those people around the world and not increase greenhouse gas emissions. So methane and equivalent um, and carbon dioxide. So we've got more mouths to feed and we've got to do it more efficiently. Um, to produce a million calories from beef, you need about 13 hectares of, of land, and that's going to make 225 tonnes of CO2. That's a problem. To make a million calories from a plant-based crop, often less than a hectare, it's a third of a hectare for pulses, and that will produce only 10 tonnes of CO2. That's mainly from transport and processing. So, apart from things like, and we're going to hear from Arjit, one of our speakers, big engineering projects, carbon capture, re reductions in the use of fossil fuels, they're, they're the other two-thirds of the equation. We have to do that. But if we plant more crops and, um, and succeed to feed those people and have a more plant-based agriculture system, we will reduce um, CO2 emissions as well. That's because plants, um, as a byproduct, fix carbon dioxide and produce sugar. That feeds the planet. Sometimes we feed those plants to animals, and that's not a very efficient way of doing things. And if you get a new cultivar, a new crop, you can make lots of money off it. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. If our farmers and horticulturalists in New Zealand are making good money, they won't have so many cows. I'm not anti-cow, I just think, we've maybe got too many of them, okay. I'm a meat eater, so I'm, I'm quite happily hypocritical on that, on that equation. Um, I, I'm addicted to the taste of meat, but I want to be provided with alternatives to that, and I will happily go towards that and pay good money for that. And if they're plant-based solutions, that's good for everybody. So how are we going to respond to this challenge? Uh, we've got to protect our plant sector that we currently have. The, the acute weather events that we had over the last summer um, illustrate that some of our crops are planted in the wrong places, and some crops just can, cannot cope with that amount of water. We've got to provide um, the, the consumers with new plant-based proteins. The Impossible Burger is one example that we see in Countdown. It tastes really good. It tastes of meat. I like it. It's grown in America because we're not allowed to grow it here. We need to rapidly develop new crops, things that we can plant that will make, uh, make our farmers good money and replace some of those cows. A lot of the data I'm, I'm quoting is from a lovely report from the World Resources Institute, uh, an NGO based out of Bargaining. Um, they, want, they, they advise in this report that we've got to raise productivity. Any agricultural system that reduces productivity is not a good idea. We need to manage demand. We need to manage, in particular, the demand for meat. And we've got to um, spur technological innovation. New Zealand needs to be the most technologically advanced agricultural system, not the North Korea of the South Pacific. When it comes to things like this, these are genetically engineered or gene edited kiwi fruit that I've made in my laboratory in Mount Albert. The one on the right in particular has got two rounds of edits um, that make it uh, uh, flower constantly, and so its stature is very short because it flowers very early instead of being a big kiwi fruit vine. And we've dropped another edit in there that makes the uh, male kiwi fruit into a hermaphrodite, so it self-pollinates. That plant on the right is unregulated in Australia. The edits that are involved in making that plant 
are not considered to be genetically modified. They're just edits. They're just tiny changes in DNA. In New Zealand, it's heavily regulated and cause, causes our public angst and fighting and shouting. Um, just recently uh, in the media on, on Sunday when Judith Collins announced her science policy, for example. So we've got this challenge of trying to persuade the public that there are some technological advances that we can use that aren't that, um, that crazy and they're going to help with, with, um, with growing our plant-based economy. Another way of growing the plant-based economy is spotting some new crops. There are 12,000 species um, of flowering plant which are edible. Some of those species, are, are, well, 150 of them are planted worldwide in quite large numbers, but only 20 species um, provide 90% of the world's food. And that's a real danger. Imagine if one of those plants, because of climate change, was to fail, then we'd lose a good portion of our calories. So the challenge is to domesticate some of those 150, to raise them into that high category, or take some of the 12,000 that have never been grown domestically, and bring them on uh, online. And that's really, well, it's not easy, but it's really fast these days. Sequence the plant's genome, look at what its fatal flaw is, often its yield, and put in some gene edits to, make, to fix that problem. And then you've got a new crop. Challenging socially, but not that challenging um, uh, scientifically. And if you get it right, then you make a lot of money. The gold kiwi fruit cultivar, not genetically engineered, not gene edited, just naturally bred, is making us $1.96 billion a year in revenue, export revenue. And planted on a very small piece of land, and mainly in, the, in, the, in Tipuki. So you don't need a lot of, of land to, to make good money, and you're not going to be raising cows in, in the Bay of Plenty. However, so on a, on a it's a great time to be a plant biologist, but in New Zealand it's still a bit tricky. In Australia, the bit in the, in the, in the dotted box is unregulated. So small edits caused by CRISPR, by gene editing, is unregulated in Australia. It's only if there's an extra piece of DNA in the plant that it's considered GMO and it's heavily regulated. In New Zealand, though, just across the Tasman, um, we only unregulate breeding, which is a bit, of, a bit annoying because I'm telling you that these other methods are a lot faster than, than breeding and they're a lot more specific. And it's not just the New Zealand-Australia comparison. The countries in green are places where gene edits, small changes in the DNA of a plant, are not regulated. And, and um, New Zealand has to compete with those countries. Uh, and they've got an advantage with the fight against uh, the, the changing climate. These countries can use technologies that we cannot use. So I hope I've persuaded you a little bit that plants are part of the solution to the climate crisis, and I, I don't think I used up my full five minutes. Thank you very much.